Uh, first of all, uh, Psalm 121, which is linked and rooted in the church of the Old Testament, the era before Christ came, looking forward, waiting for his coming. So we're reading from page 620. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth. And forevermore. And then we turn to the scriptures that were given to the church in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8. And you'll see from, well, we'll read from verse 18 where you'll see that Paul is writing about the sufferings of this present age and he's contrasting them and comparing them with the glory of the future age. So let's read then page 1137, Romans 8 and verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, we're turning to Psalm 121. And we want to focus this evening on the opening uh, two verses uh, of the psalm. I will lift up my eyes to the hill. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. These words begin what is called the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms of Going Up. And it is uh, widely held and believed that Psalm 121 to Psalm 134, uh, these, gr this group of Psalms uh, were used by the Old Testament church as they went from all the different places in the land of Canaan. You remember we had the map of our hand this morning uh, from the north to the south, uh, from the east to the west. They were required to um, appear before the Lord in Jerusalem, which was down here uh, three times a year. And it was a considerable journey uh, but uh, as we get a little glimpse of it uh, from the earthly life of our Saviour when he went up to the temple with the great throng, it was a very joyful journey uh, and occasion, although not without its dangers because they travelled through difficult territory and they travelled through dangerous places where wild animals and even bandits could attack them. And basically what happened was when the feasts drew near, uh, the people from the remotest parts, they had the longest journey to make, and so they had to start earliest if they were going to get there in time. And then they would go from, they'd go to the next city. Uh, and... Uh, uh, it's a bit like if we were going to Belfast. We'd go from Enniskillen and you'd travel to Five Mile Town and then you'd travel to Clocker and Ocher and Ballygolly. And as they did this journey and stopped at each of these towns, more and more pilgrims uh, joined them uh, to the point that when you came near Jerusalem, as we find in that final week of the life of our Saviour, you had this great vast throng descending into Jerusalem from north and from the south and from the west and from the east. And so as they travelled, they were preparing themselves for uh, the worship of God and what they were going to experience in Jerusalem over the days that they were there. And that's why the psalm begins, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. 
because Jerusalem as a city uh, was uh, surrounded by hills. And so whatever direction you were coming from, you could see um, the hills uh, once you got closer from uh, a distance. And so when the psalmist says here, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, he's not saying I'm looking to nature for help. He's saying I am looking to the hills around Jerusalem and the hill of Jerusalem itself where the temple, the place where God dwells, the place where God meets with his people in grace and salvation. That's what I'm looking towards. And as he looks towards um, this place, he sums up his expectation in two words. My help. My help. And is that not very relevant um, in our day and age? Where is help ultimately to be found? People are looking for help today in many for many different things, and they're looking in many different places. People looking for help with addictions, whether drugs or alcohol, uh, or an addiction of obsessive behavior, uh, and there's lots of schemes out there, uh, lots of help that man has devised, and I'm not rubbishing that. Uh, it's not all pointless but it falls short, short of the help that people need because um, uh, it doesn't um, give them help outside of themselves. And when you and I are in problems, when we are in the thick of it and we're crying out, help, that in itself is a statement which says, I don't have the ability in myself to deal with this situation. I need help. But it's always important that we get the right kind uh, of help. Uh, and um, ultimately, help that leaves God out of the picture entirely and absolutely uh, is no help because at best uh, it will simply um, help a person physically and in their body whereas the reality is we are more than bodies we're souls the body is mortal the body is temporal for this life and it dies and it's the soul that is all important. And so if in giving help to people, any individual, you, me or anyone else or any organization um, or any uh, body of people, if it uh, does not ultimately address the needs of the soul, which only God can deal with, then it falls short of the help that human beings need. And so it's striking, <coughs> is it not, that the psalmist, when he's going to the place of worship, and he's this opportunity to go where the presence of God is known and mediated and experienced, in other words, in the Old Testament church, he thinks of it in terms of my help. I need help for life back home, for my work day by day. I need help for bringing up my family in the circumstances of their lives and in the, the challenges of their surroundings. Uh, I need uh, help uh, as I live uh, within the community. And so he um, says, I will lift up my eyes to the, to the hills 
From where does my help come? That's a question. And he answers it then in verse 2. My help comes, or my help, literally it is, from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And so this evening I want to uh, speak on the theme, the Lord, my help. The Lord, your help. The Lord, our help as a congregation. And what kind of a help is the Lord? Well, we're used to saying in life, well, that will help a bit. That will help a little. Maybe somebody uh, gives us money when we're short uh, and, and things are tight. And we say, thank you. That will help us. That's a great help. It'll help a bit. Or somebody comes um, alongside us in a time of distress and we know that their help will help us for that hour or maybe it will continue to, to, to boost us uh, for a day or several days. But here we want to notice tonight the first thing about the Lord, my help, is he is a powerful help. He is the all-powerful help. And this comes out at the end of verse 2. Because here, attributed to the Lord God, uh, the God that the Bible presents in Old Testament and New Testament, um, the only one true and living God, what kind of a God is he? He made the heaven and earth. He made the heaven and earth. And it's striking, actually, in Scripture that again and again, when Scripture wants to draw attention to the, the help that the Lord is, and that his help is powerful, all-powerful, it takes us back again and again to the work of creation. And, uh, of course, uh, we... Uh, have the explanation of creation elsewhere in Scripture. It's summed up in uh, our catechism and confession that in six days the Lord God made out of nothing all things. It wasn't that he needed six days to do it. He could have done it in six seconds, six milliseconds, but he spread it over the six days because he was giving a pattern for uh, the life of human beings, human beings who are the apex of his creation, made in his image, that we would follow his pattern. And we would work six days, and we would have a day of rest, as God himself had. Uh, and that rest of delight, uh, that rest of of. Uh, fulfillment and, and enjoyment. And you see, to make heaven and earth, what, who could be more powerful than that? You look around you at the world of nature. Uh, you look at the sunset, the sunrise. You look at a frosty night and you see all the stars in the sky. And we have a sense of the vastness of creation. We have a sense of the orderliness of creation as well as we go through the seasons. It just struck me this afternoon, I looked out at a quarter to five, ten to five, and the days are beginning to lengthen a little bit. From that half four, quarter past four, that we had in the middle of December. And that's the way in which God has created our world. And we're told by scientists that if the earth on its axis was tilted one degree closer to the sun, we would burn up. And if we were tilted one degree further away from the sun, we would freeze to death. That's the power of God. And so the God who is my help, your help, 
Our help is a powerful help. There is no one equal to him. There is no other God equal. There is no other God at all, either um, above him or equal to him or under him. He alone is God. He alone is uh, the powerful help. And of course, if we're thinkers at all, if we're honest with ourselves, we will recognize, as the psalmist says, in man there is no help. There's no lasting help. There's no real help. There's no comprehensive help. And you um, experience that, and I think we experience that as believers, especially in a time of death. Yes, people come and they visit the, our homes. They send cards or a text. Uh, they attend the funeral. They speak to us. Uh, they shake our hands. Perhaps they embrace us and hug us. And that is wonderful. That is necessary. But you see, that is no good next week or six weeks' time when we still have that void in our hearts from the one that has been taken through death. And people can't be with us 24-7. It's no good to us when we waken in the middle of the night and our mind immediately switches to the person that we no longer have as mother or father, as husband or wife, as brother or sister or friend. But you see, this God who made heaven and earth, he is the Lord and he is a powerful help. Yes, in the time of grief and sorrow. We see that illustrated in the scriptures. John chapter 11, when um, our Lord, the Lord himself uh, in human flesh, uh, drew alongside Martha and Mary the loss of their brother Lazarus. And what did the woman say? Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. You see, they knew that there was help, all powerful help in the Lord. And Jesus said, you're going to see even greater things. Because what did Jesus do? He raised Lazarus from the dead. It was a sign that he would rise himself from the dead. Of course, Lazarus eventually died again. And so Jesus ultimately is the only man who has risen from the dead. Everyone else that he raised from the dead during his earthly ministry subsequently died. So let us this evening remember the Lord my help, a powerful help. And so let's think about our lives tonight. What is happening in your life? What is it that's challenging your circumstances? What are the things that cause you to lie awake at night or perhaps prevent you getting over to sleep? What are the things that concern you as we go into 2023? Perhaps it's something to do with work. Perhaps it's something to do with your children. Perhaps it's to do with uh, the neighborhood in which you live. Perhaps it's someone who is causing you grief and trouble in your workplace. And what do you need to remember? The Lord, my help. The powerful help. The all-powerful help. And as you come into church each Lord's Day, as you lift your eyes up to, well, we're not quite in the hills here, but as you lift your eyes up in the Sabbath morning and as you set your face to this place, you're saying, I'm coming to you, Lord, for help. In the light of my sin, in the light of my weaknesses, in the light of my needs for the week ahead, in the light of the situations and the responsibilities that you have given me. How wonderful that is. He's powerful. And he's the power of life. He's the power of death. And he is Lord over time. And he's Lord over eternity and everything else in between. So there's nothing in your life, nothing in my life, in which the Lord cannot 
and will not be your help. He's a powerful help. But then let's see, secondly, that he is a permanent help. He's a permanent help. I mentioned a few moments ago the blessing of people coming around us at a time of sorrow. But their help can't be permanent. Even those that are most concerned for us and closest to us, their, their help cannot be permanent. They've got to get back into the rhythm and the routine of life. Because they have responsibilities that they continue to discharge. They can't be with us every minute of every hour of every day. Uh, and so um, there is a need that we have beyond what man and woman can give to us and to give to one another. And so look at what the psalmist says. My help comes from the Lord. Did you notice the name? Do you notice how it's written? L-O-R-D, the capital letters. It's that covenant name of God. So my help comes from the one who has, who is married to me or who has taken me as part of his bride. That's what it literally means. It's this a word, this name that speaks of the covenant love of God um, expressed in the Old Testament by the name the Lord, fulfilled in the New Testament in the person and life and ministry of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. And so he is a permanent help. There's not a moment of the day or night when he is not available to the believer. And that's the wonderful difference between the old covenant church and the new covenant church. The old covenant church, you had to go to the Lord through, a, or to God through an earthly priest appointed from men for the benefit of men. But now we live in the era of the new covenant church when there is one priest Jesus Christ, as we read there in our call to worship in Hebrews, the high priest, the apostle of our faith, the one sent from heaven down as God and took human flesh to himself as man to be what no other earthly priest had ever been, a sinless man representing sinful men and women living for us, dying for us, rising for us, ascending for us, sitting down at the right hand of the Father for us, so that when we come uh, to, to God through Christ in repentance and faith and in salvation, we have all these blessings opened up to us. But Scripture says we are in union with Christ. We're joined to Christ. We're married to Christ. How beautiful that is to have the permanent help. Yes, we appreciate our marriage partners, our spouses, I hope. And we value the help that they are to us. God made a helper for Adam in the beginning because he knew that the man needed a helper. But even the best wife on this earth is um, a wonderful blessing, but falls far short of the blessing of the Lord to whom we are married in salvation and who is a permanent help. A permanent help. Did Jesus not say what did he say to his disciples? Yes, I'm going away, but I send the Comforter. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There's not a morning you or I get up that he is not there as our help. There's not a night we lay down our heads 
when he is not there as our help. Our biggest problem, is it not, is asking for help, seeking help, admitting we need help. Because in our own pride, and it's still there, even after, we've, after we're saved and the Lord has to break it down uh, bit by bit, day by day, month by month, year by year, but in our own pride, we all so often approach things and say, I can manage this. I can do it. I don't need any help. The reality is, brother and sister in Christ, I cannot draw another breath without the help of the Lord. That's how fundamental it is. And if that's true, that you and I cannot draw another breath without the help of the Lord. We can't take another step without the help of the Lord. We can't live another day. We can't do a single thing without the help of the Lord. That's why it's so important that every day we seek help from the Lord. And that's why he's made himself available in this way, because we need a permanent help. Such is our weakness and the resulting weakness of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 and sin coming into human life, that only the Lord is the answer to that day by day. So the Lord, my help, he's a powerful help. He's a permanent help. And we ask ourselves this evening the question, what area of your life, and is there an area of my life where I think I'm going to manage this myself? As Frank Sinatra said, I'll do it my way. Instead of us admitting and confessing, Lord, this is beating me. It's grinding the life out of me. It's making my very existence a misery. And I need your help. I need to be, uh, I need your help in my life as a believer. I need to come to the bridegroom and say, help me. What would you think, man, what would you think if your wife was in great need and she went to somebody else? Or she tried to struggle on in her own. Would you not say to her, why did you not come to me? Sinner, why did you not tell me about your struggle? And if, we, if she was to go to somebody else, would say, why did you go to them? Why did you not come to me? Is it that you don't trust me? Is it that you think I don't care? Would we not ask all of those questions at a human level? And ought not our Savior to say to us the same things? If we do not seek help from him, did you think I wasn't able? Did you think I was too busy? Did you think I didn't care? That's what the disciples thought, isn't it? When they were in the boat and the rain was crashing in, doesn't care. He's asleep. So, brethren, whatever it is in your life and my life, whatever that thing is that is most challenging and takes the energy out of you, takes the spring out of your step, takes the joy out of your life, the Lord is not only a powerful help, he's a permanent help. Seek his help. But then thirdly, I want us to see that the Lord is a personal help. He is the personal help. And we're picking up now on the little phrase, my. 
My. You see, it's not that um, this help comes to people whether they ask for it or not. The, God, the Lord God, in a very real sense, doesn't get crash. He doesn't uh, uh, treat us like robots and, and force himself upon us. He will speak to us. He will call us. He will invite us. We're thinking here now, if you look back uh, at before your conversion, and there are times when he's done that for years and years, and the point had to come where you said, Lord, I cannot live life any longer. I need your help, which is at the most fundamental level of all, salvation. Salvation. I've tried everything to satisfy a guilty conscience. I've tried everything uh, to, um, to cope with life. I've tried everything uh, to live life and to enjoy life, but there's no enjoyment in life. There's no fulfillment. And you see, that's when God, um, in his mercy, um, he humbled us to that point, And then he enabled us at that point to cry out, Lord, my help, my salvation. Lord Jesus, remember that's what the name ultimately means here. You lived a life without sin. And... You died for sinners uh, to take away sin. I am a sinner. Take away my sin. Make me part of your bride. And take me as your child. Be my help, my help uh, in the light of my sin. And be my help then in all the situations of my life. You see, it comes down to the personal, my help. We can't hide behind the, um, the plural pronoun, our help, and say, well, I come into church and I can smuggle in on the coattails of others. No, no, it doesn't work that way doesn't work that way. It has got to be personal. We individually um, have to seek his help, which is firstly and fundamentally salvation. And I ask this evening, have all of us done that? You who are listening uh, online at uh, a later stage, uh, through YouTube, have you humbled yourself before Christ Jesus? Have you confessed that you're a sinner? Have you asked him to pardon your sin and to give you that righteousness that is his, that you need to stand in the presence of God? Have you said, my help, my salvation comes from the Lord. Salvation is from the Lord. It's not from man. It's not from the church. It's not from baptism. It's not from the Lord's Supper. It's not from good works. It's not from anything but the Lord. And so my help. That's where we've got to get to before we're saved. But then when we are saved every day, we're to live in such a way as demonstrates and articulates my help comes from the Lord. It was striking in the past week when I was in the hospital with my mother 
and then going to the intensive care unit and medical staff became aware of the, the, the two situations and, and how they expressed compassion and sympathy and they said, how are you coping with this? How can you do this? Uh, go um, from uh, your mother to Caroline and then on Thursday when people uh, realised that Caroline had died that morning and that I was going to have a funeral on Saturday as well as the, my mother's uh, funeral on Thursday, people said uh, rightly and understandably, how are you going to cope? That in the midst of your own grief and loss, you have this added situation. And all I can say, brethren, is it's beyond me. My help has come from the Lord. And has come to me in answer to your prayers and the prayers of others who have borne me up before the throne of grace. Not just in this past week, but continually. That's what you do. And so it shows. It shows because people note and they say, how is it that you can do this? And that's the opportunity for you and for me to say in a very humble but hopefully God-glorifying way, my help comes from the Lord Jesus. You see, it's personal. When your back is against the wall and when your emotions and your heart is torn in different directions and your responsibilities humanly conflict, then you're able, you're unable to do, as Paul said, all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so Paul was able to rejoice with those who were um, rejoicing and he was able to weep with those who were sorrowing. Why? Because the divine indwelt him and his help was the Lord. Brethren and all who listen beyond the believing community, can you say, the Lord Jesus, my help? If you can't, you ultimately have no help in life and in death, in time or in eternity. Amen.